Hey guys, Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to another virtual lecture. In today's video, we're going to learn about the pooled t-test. Now, in the last video, we've learned about hypothesis testing for two samples when both samples are large and when we know the population standard deviation. Now, what if both of our samples are small in size and that we don't know the population standard deviation? Well, this is the kind of test that we can use for those instances. So I made this diagram in the last video to uh, basically illustrate uh, what it means by conducting a hypothesis testing for two independent samples, okay? So if you remember, we have two populations which are independent of each other, and from each of these populations, we uh, collect um, independent samples, okay? So from these samples, we can get um, their sample means. Okay, so in our hypothesis test, particularly in step three, we'll calculate uh, the test statistic based on these sample means. Okay, so in the end, when we reach step six, we conclude and make interpretations to generalize it back to the population. Okay, but one key point, uh, when we study this hypothesis testing for two samples in the previous video, both of our sample sizes were large, okay? They were both more than 30. So what happens now, in this case, our sample sizes are small, okay? And besides that, we also do not know sigma. Okay, so this is basically the case, oh, you can't see that, okay? This is basically the case where we will use the pooled t-test, okay? Pooled t-test. So you may be wondering why the word pooled here. Okay, as you can see here, we don't know what sigma is, right? We don't know. Sigma is unknown here. Sigma is also unknown here. But we've learned from previous chapters that if we don't know sigma, we can use its best estimate, which are the sample standard deviation. So here we can get the sample standard deviation from sample one. We also can get the sample standard deviation from sample two. So what we're going to do is we're going to pool these two fellows together, okay, and come up with a single estimate, which is called the pooled um, sample standard deviation. So we're going to write it as S, okay, it's not really S2P, okay, it's called the <laughs> pooled sample variance. Okay guys, so this is what we did for hypothesis testing on two population means when the sample sizes are large and both the uh, population standard deviations are known. Okay, so I mentioned to you just now, we follow the same six steps, but there are differences when we write the hypothesis in step one, as well as how to calculate the uh, test statistic in step three. So this is how we write the hypothesis for a two population mean test. Okay, here as you can see, the null hypothesis is we assume both population means are equals as opposed to the alternate here is uh, not equals to, or as I mentioned to you before, it can either be one is greater than the other or lesser than the other, it depends on the uh, context of the test, okay? And for the third step, which is to find the test statistic, we use Z, because as I mentioned to you just now, both sample sizes are large and we know sigma. So this is the formula. Up here at the numerator, we find the difference between the two sample means divided by the standard error. Okay, now for the pool t-test, the objective of the test is very similar to the test before in that we are finding whether there's a difference or any similarities between two population means. But the difference is now we've got smaller sample sizes and that both populations and deviations are not known. Okay, so because the objective of the test is the same, therefore for step one, there is no difference. Okay, we still write the same way, meaning there's no difference between the two population means, that's our null hypothesis, and our alternate hypothesis is there is a difference between the population means, or one population means bigger than the other, or one population mean is smaller than the other, okay? So the difference here basically lies in step three, okay? Because, okay, it's called a pool t-test because, in this case, since we do not know the sigmas, meaning what we have instead is just the sample standard deviation, right? So we have the sample standard deviation for the first sample, and we also have the sample standard deviation for the second sample. Okay, therefore, what we're going to do is we're going to pool these two guys together, okay, to become an estimate, estimate of the pooled 
variance, okay? So that's why it's called the pool t-test. So first things first, we need to find this pool variance or estimate of the pool variance first. So in step three, we're basically going to do uh, two steps in step three, okay? So the first thing we want to do is we want to find or to calculate the estimate of the pooled variance. So how do we get this? Okay, it's very simple. What we need to do is first um, find the degrees of freedom for the first sample. Okay, degrees of freedom is n minus one, right? But since we've got two samples now, we, so we have to be specific. N one, the first sample, minus one, so this is the degrees of freedom for the first sample, multiply with the sample variance for the first sample plus the degrees of freedom for the second sample multiply with the sample variance for the second sample over the combined degrees of freedom. Okay, how do you get the combined degrees of freedom? It's n1 plus n2 minus 2. Okay, in case you're wondering how we get this, okay, let me just, um, where should I write it? Okay, let's, okay, let's just go to this side. Remember, the degrees of freedom is basically n minus 1, right? n minus 1 is the degrees of freedom. But now since we've got two samples, so it's n1 minus 1, and we have to add the second degrees of freedom, n2 minus 1. So if we open up the bracket, it's n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1. So we just expand it, n1 plus n2 minus 1 and minus 1 becomes minus 2. Okay, so that is where, okay, that's how we get our denominator here. It's basically the degrees of freedom for two samples. Okay, now once we have the estimate of the pooled variance, now is basically finding the test statistic, which is T. Remember, it's called the pooled T test, so we can't use Z, it's T. And remember, because our objective is the same, that is why our step one is the same, therefore our numerator is the same, guys, okay? So the numerator, all right, let me just, okay, the numerator is similar because we want to find the difference between the two population means, but because we don't know what the population means are, we use the best estimate, which is uh, which are the sample means. So here we want to find the difference between the two sample means over, okay, this is where it's different, down here. We use the estimate of the pooled variance just now, which is here, estimate of the pooled variance. We multiply with one over the first sample size plus one over the second sample size. And because it's a standard error, we square root it, okay? Right, so let's zoom back out. Hopefully you can see the difference in writing the hypothesis testing between the pool t-test and the two population mean test, and of course, in finding the test statistic. One uses z because we've got large sample size, and we know the population standard deviation. Here we use t because it's a pool t-test. The assumptions to conducting a pool t-test is similar to before, okay, in that we use the same six steps, but we make the following assumptions. Both populations must follow the normal distribution, the populations must have equal standard deviations, and that the samples are from independent populations. Let's take a look at this example for a pooled t-test. A recent study compared the time spent together by single and dual earner couples. According to the records kept by the wives during the study, the average amount of time spent together watching TV among the single earner couples was 61 minutes a day, with a standard deviation of 15.5 minutes. For the dual earner couples, the average number of minutes spent watching TV together was 48.4 minutes, with a standard deviation of 18.1 minutes. At the 1% significance level, can we conclude that the single earner couples on average spend more time watching TV together? It was also mentioned that there were 15 single earner couples and 12 dual earner couples studied. So first things first, let's define the variables so that we don't get confused. Maybe you would like to define one or two as single earner couples and dual earner couples. Here I will define it as S. Okay, so S B for the single earner couples. Okay, and D is the dual earner couples. Okay, so we can write down all of the respective um, information given. So the sample mean for the single earner couples are 61 minutes. Okay, the sample mean for the dual earner couples are 48 0.4 minutes, okay, and then we were given the 
sample standard deviation for the single earner couples of 15.5 minutes and the sample standard deviation for the dual earner couples are 18.1 minutes and the number of single earner couples studied was 15 whereas the number of dual earner couples studied was 12. Okay. okay step one we begin by writing the hypothesis okay so remember the null is always equals to right so we assume that um, both the population means for the single and dual earner couples are equal to each other so mu s equals to mu d okay alternatively okay, here's where we need to look at the question it asks us okay, what does it ask us okay is it true that the single earner couples on average spend more time okay so more hence we can put here as single earner couples spend more time than dual earner couples in watching tv together okay right so this is how we write the hypothesis now step two okay we write down what our alpha is it's given as 1%, so 0 0.01. And this here is a one tilt test, right? Because the sign for the alternate hypothesis points to a particular direction. So it's one tilt test. Step three, we want to calculate the test statistic. But because this is a pooled T test, we have to find the pooled variance first. Okay, the estimate of the pooled variance first. Okay, remember how do we do that estimate of the pooled variance okay find the degrees of freedom for the first sample multiply with the sample variance for the first sample plus the degrees of freedom for the second sample multiply with the sample variance for the second sample over the combined degrees of freedom and s plus nd minus two okay so we basically just plug in all of the figures that we've identified before okay so okay hold on Sorry, I'm just adjusting this too much. 15 minus 1 multiply with 15.5 square. Okay, square because what they gave us earlier was just standard deviation. Plus 12 minus 1 times 18.1 square over 15 plus 12 minus 2. Okay, so work on that. You will get 278.69. Okay, so this is our estimate of the pooled variance. Now, from here, we calculate the test statistic, which is T. Okay, the numerator is the difference between the two, oops, S, uh, the difference between the two sample mean over the pooled variance, estimate of the pooled variance, times 1 over the first sample size, plus 1 over the second sample size, square rooted. Okay, so here... It's basically, okay, what was the mean for the single inner couples just now? 61, right? 61 minus 48.4 over 278.69. How do you get this here just now? Times 1 over the first sample size plus 1 over the second sample size. Square this. Okay, work on that. Okay, work on that. You will get 1.95. Now the next step, step four, okay, we need to write down our rejection rule. So in doing so, we need to show the rejection areas or rejection area since it's a one tail test. Now here's T, okay, because we're doing a pool T test. In the center here is zero, okay. So we know it's a one tail test because the sign here points to a particular direction. Yeah, so... Um, what is the direction? Can you imagine to know the direction, whether it's positive or negative, you just bring this right-hand side to the left-hand side. So if it's mu s minus mu d greater than zero, right? So greater than zero means the rejection area would be here on the right. So here is the rejection area. So we write it as reject the null. And the entire alpha is here. So our alpha is 1%. And here would be our reject... Um, acceptance area so this is where we do not reject the null hypothesis so um, the critical value is the value of t that separates the acceptance from the rejection area so here if you remember um, how do we find the t critical value okay open up your t table okay first of all find the degrees of freedom yeah so the the, the degrees of freedom 
in this case is just now we've calculated it okay so it's basically 25 it's n1 or ns plus nd minus 2 which is 15 plus um, 12 minus 2 okay 25 okay you look at your t table look at degrees of freedom 25 and then look at one tail test um, one percent so you will get the critical value to be 2.485 okay so now moving on step five and six together okay so step five all we have to do is just to compare the test statistic that we calculated just now which is one point where is it 1.95 okay we compare the test statistic that we calculated just now against um, the rejection or acceptance area so 1.95 is here guys okay so you can see that the test statistic falls in the acceptance area okay therefore we do not reject the null so we put that in writing since the test statistic lies in the acceptance area or region okay so we do not reject the null hypothesis okay and conclude okay that's basically step six we conclude that um what okay how do we interpret let's go back to step one okay so we say do not reject right so do not reject so meaning we agree that there is no difference between the time taken or time or the average amount of time spent watching tv together there's no difference here okay so let's go back down here and we can conclude that there is no difference no difference in the mean or average amount of time watching TV together. Watching TV together between the single earner couples and the dual earner couples. Do not reject. No difference. Okay?